you have had a pleasant evening repast. Delighted to say that the English language team is back with you, RSL on RS1 and around the world on YouTube for our World Feed TV. Just one further plateau to go this evening, taking us into the evening hours. We're just finishing off. In fact, this is the last lap of the second grid. Uh, being led at the moment by the Halusas in the Jaguar D-Type. 35 seconds to the good on the uh, Wakeman and uh, Pat Blitney Edwards Cooper T38 from 1955. Then there's the Maserati, number five in third position. Another seven and a half seconds further back. As usual, plenty of classes here. We'll see this class in full tomorrow and uh, take you through how things are going. Remember, all of these races today are the first of three that will make up effectively the... make up the event for the weekend. So whilst this race comes to an end, we've got the opportunity to do something a little bit different, which we haven't yet done today. Okay, V1 cruising to a victory here. Just going through Arnage for the final time. Dark green, very famous at 1954 Jaguar D-Type, heading towards the curve, the Porsche curves. And Andrew Marriott and Peter Snowden will join me in a moment. But first, let's hear from the man who's put all of this together. Peter Otto and the man at the head of it is Patrick Peter speaking to us earlier this weekend. Et franchement, le lien entre les 24 heures du Mans qui fêtent leur centième anniversaire et le Mans classique est encore plus évident qu'avant. Bah, il est évident parce que euh, normalement, so, on n'aurait pas dû avoir lieu cette année. Normalement, euh, le Mans classique c'est tous les deux ans, donc ça devait être 2022-2024. Et puis on en a parlé avec Pierre Pierre, le président de la uh, race this year rather than uh, next year. Actually, we'll come back to that in a moment because we're just going to see the chequered flag for the Halusi car. So let's see that. And we can go back to Patrick in just a second. Here he is now. Patrick Peter, cette année, franchement, le lien entre les 24 heures du Mans qui fêtent leur centième anniversaire et le Mans classique est encore plus évident qu'avant. So the, the Le Mans que, uh, Classic and Le Mans Centenary edition on the same year. Now, normally it would be next year, but Maceo. the opportunity to put them both together was well, just uh, too good to miss. And Donc, in association ensemble, with the ACO, getting the together for this year, for all the reasons, it makes perfect sense dont la technique, l'esthétique, etc. ont marqué l'histoire des 24 heures. It's uh, great to come so quickly demain, after the centenary of the 24 hours. Uh, et donc on se dit, bah, il, faut, il faut le faire. Et donc, étendons le centenaire. Et and ça commence début juin et ça finit le 3 juin. Following the 
Et vous êtes sold out, comme on dit en anglais. Oui, It's on est sold out. Euh, Fantastic. Sold out, Alors, sold out on tout à fait clair, Saturday. On a commencé euh, la promotion d'événements très longtemps. Il y a, il y a, on a commencé Few à, tickets left à, for Sunday. En Californie, à Pebble Beach et Laguna Seca l'année dernière. Uh, when you put et this immédiatement, on a eu un retour out there, is it one of the best? Well, yes, Donc, along euh, with on a été obligé de refuser beaucoup de Pebble Beach and Amelia Islands, etc. Uh, ce qui est très triste, mais en même temps, on ne peut pas accepter tout le monde. Uh, it's on big. a refusé uh, des voitures de club et puis and on it's a great to have all the car clubs here over 200 of them with eight and a half thousand cars visiter le Mans classique dans des conditions agréables ce qui est pas évident Hopes quand il y a trop de monde Donc, has a good time uh, de visiting monde. je pense que on va avoir franchi assez largement le cap des 230 000 spectateurs mais il faut savoir s'arrêter 230 il faut que ça reste and 30000 spectators over the weekend est-ce que concernant les concurrents les, les 1000 pilotes, les, les, les 800 voitures VHC, les 8500 voitures de club, vous êtes au, au maximum là aussi un peu des capacités ou, ou pas Those numbers, là, On est au maximum 8, dans la configuration de club. Après ça, on peut toujours tout cars, imaginer. Is that the maximum? Je vous rappelle que quand well, on a commencé en 2002, c'était samedi, dimanche. Euh, il devait y avoir 300 It's voitures. Il devait y avoir de more spaces, but maximum. There's no il real avait maximum. Beaucoup trop peu de spectateurs. Euh, il fallait. Euh, être un peu accroché pour accepter de continuer parce que But he did have to turn some entries down. Mais, euh, ça a monté d'année en année et maintenant c'est un grand succès. Mais est-ce qu'en 2002, franchement, déjà dans un petit coin de votre tête, il y avait le centenaire de 2020 non. non, ce ne serait pas honnête de le dire. Il y a toujours, faut toujours vous dire, oui bien sûr, j'y avais pensé quand j'étais au berceau. Non, ce n'est pas vrai. Donc c'est pas vrai. Donc euh, 30 000, on était très contents. Bon, he on says, vise uh, toujours deux fois pour le plus, mais on visait pas Dernière question, l'an dernier, Final vous avez question. communiqué sur ce carburant de synthèse qui allait équiper très peu de voitures. Enfin, je m'en souviens, c'était 4-5 de mémoire. Et là, vous avancez la moitié du plateau. On est épaté par cette progression. Bah, Having nous all these aussi, nous aussi cars. on est ravis, on est ravis parce qu'effectivement, on a Here, très précisément équipé 4 voitures l'année dernière. Les 4 voitures ont terminé sans aucun problème. Il y en a même une qui a terminé sur le podium, une Porsche 904. Et donc, on a décidé d'aller beaucoup plus loin. Donc, je peux pas vous dire si c'est 45 ou 45 mais grosso modo, il y a la moitié du, du plateau, des plateaux euh, qui vont être équipés de ce, de ce carburant. Euh, et et l'objectif, il n'est il est pas là. L'objectif, il est, il est 2025 de le rendre obligatoire. Make parce sure que euh, ces carburants de synthèse sont merveilleux. Ça we can continue using euh, these cars in a more friendly way. de 70%. C'est miscible avec euh, de l'essence normale, etc. Et euh, on n'a aucune adaptation à faire sur le moteur. Donc clairement, je pense que c'est l'avenir des fails. voitures anciennes. Et c'est aussi probablement l'avenir, sans passer des, par des voitures classiques, uh, je pense que c'est aussi l'avenir de beaucoup, beaucoup de voitures à moteur thermique. <laughs> Euh, lots and lots of the tunnel combustion engines euh, still out there. Que met, euh, dans les ZFE, dans ceci, dans and cela, etc. this is a great opportunity to show them off. And it's up to the politicians to make the other decisions, says Patrick Peter. So this race has just completed. And this was the first outing for the second plateau. Peter Snowden was watching along. And not, I don't think you're surprised that that Toulouse D-Type from 1954 uh, won the race. It was being driven with some verve, uh, even though Pat, Pat Blakeney Edwards was uh, a part of the driving uh, team for the Cooper T38 in second position. And they were in the same uh, uh, class, in fact, with uh, Frederick Wickman driving that car as well. Yeah, I mean, Pat Blakeney Edwards, we, we know him well in... Uh, UK historic racing and, and European more and more now extensively uh, going back to Goodwood days in in Owlet uh, which you know, used to drive extraordinarily well in the wet and uh, uh, go and look it up on on various uh, platforms streaming platforms and to watch him driving that but certainly on the Goodwood site as well um, I think Pat Blakeney Edwards driving could be best described as flamboyant at the better times uh, so uh, effective though so very effective very efficient uh, and, and very controlled as well. And one thing yes. I will say, because I, I raced against him in, uh, in Wood, well, Woodcote Trophy in Sterling Moss in the, back in the UK. Uh, and he's one of those people that there are certain people on track, and there are many, some, some less so, but there are many. It doesn't matter how close quarter you get with them, you can trust them. Yes. You know what they're going to do. That's and a very that, good point. that way you can race importantly. So yes. my point being, and that's a second place car. So, the, you know, Nicholas Alusa in that D type, um, 
what, what's flamboyant? Flamboyant plus? Did he put it in? Plum, did he put the D-type in Sport Plus? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it didn't have that that option in period, and but doesn't have now. But uh, Nicholas Lahusa, just a great, great driver, really, really smooth, really tidy, and, and very, very efficient. Richard Wilson was in third in the Maserati 250S from 1958. He was a class winner in sixth. Christian Presdorf in a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Coupe. The number 73 car, he won his class. Fergus McLeod in the Porsche 550, lovely. 1957 550A, the number 30 car was eighth and won his class. Rainer Becker in another 550 Spider, that was a 1955 car. In the 62 car, he won his class. Stefan Koenig in an ACS Bristol 1957. Beautifully turned out car, that number seven. 17th overall and wins his class. Nicholas, uh, sorry, Harold Godin in the Maserati 200S from 1955, won his class, that was 20th position for the 65. The number six in 21st, Nicholas Treber, in a Fiat uh, 8 Val from 1963, 8V from uh, 1963, excuse me, won his class. Gaël Réjean won in the Mark 9 Lotus from 1955, the number 78 car in 23rd position. Uh, Gilles Corradon won in the Porsche pre-A 356, very early car there in the number 79 car in 24th position. Uh, Amory Gariel in another, uh, in another Lotus, this time in 11 from 1958. Laurent Desplas in an Aston Martin DB2 Sports Saloon. The number 38 car won the GTS 7A category. Peter Terrell won in the Jaguar XK120 OTS. 1952 version of that car, the number 34. Pierre Macchi won the, in the Frisian National Mont Coupe. Uh, he won his class, that was the number 81 car in 35th position. Derek Drinkwater in the Cadillac Series 61 Le Monstre, which we saw as one of the cars that uh, had won here. He won his class, that recreation of the car, 22 in uh, number 22 in 42nd position. Francois Fouquier at Villa in a DB HBR5 from 1961, won his class. Uh, still going. Uh, Alan Serpagi, Serpagi, excuse me, in the Renault 4 CV Moto from 1964, won his class in the 71 car in 55th position and 64th position. Oh no, sorry, missed a few. Francois de Gaillard won in his Panard. Michel Blanchard won in a DB HBR from 1964. Jean Francois Penilla in a Porsche 356 Pre A 1100. All class winners. Antoine Laro in another DB. HR Spider Le Mans from 59. Uh, he won his class in 64th position. The Triumph TR2 stopped out on the track, so I'm not sure whether Jeff Gordon, not that one, it's spelled G E or double F, not Jeff. Uh, he was listed as his leader in class. But I'm not sure if he'll still take that victory, uh, having um, not made it to the line, but of course, it's all about the next two races. So that is how they finished and the uh, leaders in their classes. There are some time penalties that I think have been added on, so I won't go through those again. Bit of smoke coming out of the very tidy number 59, which is on its slow down lap, actually. Let's hope that that gets around the eight and a half miles to its pit. Well, no, it's just it's taken the flag already. It's going to come in now to the Bugatti circuit, isn't it? Oh yes, good point. Yes, yeah. not to go all it, the way it around. It was smoking coming coming through the beer, uh, through the, the full chicane as well. But that is the oh, you know the huge grid here, huge grid. It's the um, Aero Minor Sport 750 from 1949. Yaroslav Vetvikia. There was 85 cars meant to start that race. Only one didn't start. That was Guy Fabrice Mestro in the TRT. Um, everybody else started, although we did have about 10 cars that didn't make it to the end of the race. Last running car, Miles Griffiths in the Keith Sport, 1955, the number 54 car, uh, finishing as the last running car. Results scrolling through. So welcome back to you all. If you have just joined us after the wee break, this is our final 
plateau for tonight. They'll race on into the evening here. And for those of you at the circuit, of course, uh, a reminder that public transport will be stopping around uh, 9 o'clock tonight. And the last trams out of the terminus by the... Um, by the stadium are, is 8.15 back to Le Mans, the city of Le Mans. So if you are relying on that, please plan accordingly if you listen to us on uh, RS1. One last thing, John, that just uh, the elusive driven uh, D-type that uh, got the fastest last world, a yeah. 5.029. So wow. Just, just over a smidge over, not even three seconds over five minutes for a 1954 car around here and bear in mind it's a it's a slower circuit than it probably was in in that period because it's it's got the it chicanes is. in etc now but obviously it's been resurfaced and stuff and whatever certain places but five minutes in a car that's that old it's pretty impressive on tires that are not not exactly uh overdone with tread width and remember eight and a half miles mm. eight yeah. and a half miles work the average out yourself good evening andrew looking forward to plateau number th Number three? Number three, certainly, yes. I think it's going to be a good race. But I've just been out in the paddock trying to find out a bit what, what happened. We had a couple of mysteries, didn't we, in, um, mm. particularly with the Talbot team um, in Plateau 1. The uh, penalty to the Burnett car, which crossed the line first, I've just been speaking to the team manager. They do not know what it's for. Ooh. They think it may be for administrative reasons, something to do with the paperwork, rather than anything to do that happened oh, on the really? track. But they have not been told officially. So that's yeah. what they're thinking. Remember, they didn't start one of their two teams, or one of their two team cars. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a team decision in the end, deciding just to concentrate on the one car. So uh, that's that. The, um, the Hulu's car, which uh, blew up with, with Ames, I couldn't find them, but the Talbot think people think he missed a gear. Ah. And it looked a bit like that, didn't it? Bit of an over-rev. That was the first lap as well. First lap, yeah. Just going through Turt Rouge. Yeah. So, so that was the story with that race. Um, this coming race, last year it was won by Ollie Bryant in his Lotus 15. Well, that's in the garage. So he's going to race it at Goodwood later in the season, but not racing it here. So uh, he won last year from James Cottingham and Max Girardo in a, a, a Tajira, which is also not here. And uh, third was uh, Joe Macari and uh, Harrison Newey in the D-type. Well, uh, Harrison Newey um, will be in this race, John. So Plateau 3 next and our final action of Saturday night. Don't forget, we'll be back tomorrow. Time to go racing. One of the smallest amounts of uh, time, chronological time, in terms of the eligibility of the cars. We're just talking about the years from 1957 to 1961. Titled La Dolce Vita, The Good Life, things were changing in the late 50s and the early 1960s. The uh, spectre of the World War was slightly further behind and things were beginning to pick up and that was reflected in the automotive industry as it was in other parts of life. Manufacturers uh, coming back with some fantastic new cars and going back motor racing. Hello everybody, this is John Hindorf with Andrew Marriott and Peter Snowden as we're getting ready for our third plateau of the five this year, each of them racing three times. This is the first run out for grid number three and what a mix of cars here it's called the good life and with good reason andrew marriott absolutely, absolutely johnson my great cars in this race and the one i'm particularly focusing on at the moment is the famous ferrari bread van in the third race of the plateau a year ago we saw it have a huge accident with lucas halusa at the wheel well the car has been repaired by mick mobley and his crew and that car is back even better. They've changed a few things to make it more original. original. Yeah. Obviously, it was a specially bodied uh, Ferrari um, 250 GT. Uh, 
there was a lot of work on it, but the chassis wasn't damaged, I'm told. And it was bodywork suspension, because it was a spectacular crash, if you remember, Peter. You weren't here, John, um, John that No, that I was day, watching. But, but it was a big shunt. Anyway, it, it's an iconic car, and it's been rebuilt. Also looking for, the, we've got uh, a former winner of this race. We've got four times winner, is it? Five times winner. Emanuele Pirro is in here, sharing with uh, Hans Hugenholz. They are in pole position. James Wood in the Lotus 15, he's always quick. That's going to be right up there, second fastest. And then we've got more listers. And uh, got Gordon Shedden in the car, which finished fourth. Uh, in, sorry, qualified fourth. Shedden not having, uh, I think, raced a lister just once before. So th that will be exciting. And then we've got another winner of the race outright, Andy Wallace in the Jaguar T-Type. He qualified fifth. And then in sixth is Harrison Newey together with uh, Blakeney Edwards racing again. Ivano Pero, of course, a five-time winner. Five-time five yeah. winner of Le Mans itself, and uh, Andy Wallace, uh, uh, a single-time winner. And, uh, Gordon Shedden, multiple British touring car champion uh, back in the UK, uh, and has taken part in uh, Goodwood in various events, uh, Monaco Historic. But I think this is his first time at Le Mans Classic. I could not believe yeah. that yeah, when it is. we took that fact up. I would have lost money on that. You just heard Andrew Marriott and then Peter Snowden. We've made John Hindoff in the Global Broadcast Centre. These cars, perhaps a little early for some of you who are watching, but you will recognise them. Another 80-car grid. Patrick Peter and his organisation having done a, a fantastic job. Patrick telling us in an interview that they had to turn down probably the better part of 200 cars uh, and drivers. Well, that's an organiser's dream, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so a, reserve, a reserve list. Yeah. Um, this year, uh, out of all of the years, perhaps, that is understandable, but quite extraordinary in terms of the interest in this event, which has just uh, spiralled upwards since its first running in 2002. This is the 11th running of the event. Normally, every other year, COVID put a spanner in those works and things got thrown around just a little bit and decided that it was a good idea to have this extra event for the centenary and from what Patrick was saying there, it, this then will put the, the event on the odd years rather than the even years that it has been in the past. Safety car lights are out. John, I think it's Pirro, isn't it? Starting in the... Uh, that is... Yeah, that looks like his helmet. In, in the Lister? In the Lister, yeah. yeah. Um, that's what I spoke to Hugenholz yesterday. He said Pirro would start this race. Um, for Sorry, Andrew. But they do change their minds, of course. Yes. <laughs> no, that looks well, like Piro's helmet. And we should say as well, we are going by helmets here because, as you can imagine, with 800-plus cars um, and of this era, they don't have driver IDs on them. So um, Al Kamel doing a cracking job to get us the information that they do. I cannot imagine how much equipment and processing power they've got in the timing room. Lots of data entry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the old radio adage of when you were putting stuff into um, the traffic, what we used to call the traffic computers and the, uh, the uh, play-out computers, uh, all the hard work is beforehand and the preparation is everything, so everything's got to go in correctly. So here are the front row cars. 63 and uh, sorry, 65 and 63 are on the front row. That's on pole position. The list of Jaguar costing from 1959, from the same year, the Lotus 15, uh, and that uh, is alongside. And as you've heard, Andrew just say, it will be five times Le Mans winner overall. Emmanuel Pirro, who drives the car, just uh, in the 65 car, just uh, slightly waving around. So the car and pole is the one with the yellow stripe down it. Then we've got a Lister Jaguar flat eye in 1960. That's the number 67 car on the second row from Saif Hassan's Lister Nobili from 59. We'll tell you all about why they're called that during the 43 minutes of the race, because we'll have time. Then, formerly named Andrew Wallace. Now, was that Andy in the car? He's got quite a distinctive... Yeah. I think it was. It is. He's not sharing that car with anyone. Oh, okay. Sure it is. That's a D-type from 1957. Harrison Newey, who is a very capable young racing driver, well, well, not racing as much as he used he, to I, now. I had a chat with him yesterday. He's, he's, for the time being, he has 
given up being a professional racing driver, just concentrating on these historic events. He tried really hard to get his father to come and race here, as he has done in the past, but um, just Adrian had to go to, 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 there was too much going on at Red Bull Ring. So he isn't here this year, he hopes he'll be back in two. Ray. Uh, row four, Rebel Lips in the first non-British car, the Ferrari 250 GT SWB, short wheelbase from 61, and alongside that, the rebuilt and lead it, both of these cars leading its, their classes, the two Ferraris, the bread van from 1962, so-called because of the shape of the bodywork. Another Ferrari next up, uh, which is another car that Harrison knew he's involved in, he'll be swapping between them, number 42 is another 250 GT, making up the top 10, Christian Glasel uh, for Jaguar in the D-Type from 1957. Uh, and Gary Pearson in that car as well, always makes the D-Type uh, go quick. Th that'll be very quick then, that's the number 44 car in 10th position. So, for the final time on the World TV feed, but remember we'll be back tomorrow for two more uh, sessions with you, so check majorlemon.com for the times. We wait for the green flag and 43 minutes on the clock and we are racing. Nice clean start from the top 10 or so. The lights have gone out and they fan out across what is a particularly wide start. Grid here, here comes the T-type. Yeah. Straight through, what a run that is. For the number 49, that's Andrew. Andrew. Andy Wallace, stop looking at the timing screen, Hindhoff, and he gets up. I think in the second place there, he was just picked from going into the lead, and that's a very clean start indeed as they're through and under the Dunlop Bridge for the first time, heading down towards the Forest S's, and it's the Lotus that's taking the lead, Peter. Yeah, quite quite extraordinarily so. The uh, Imam Pillow just not getting there. The bread van also had a little look around there, had a good run, and he's got around the outside. The bread van's made up a few places uh, there. Andy Wallace showing his metal there. He's... Uh, He's slightly experienced, isn't he? Uh, first attempt at driving yeah. the morning, won it. He did. The Lotus 15, uh, sorry, Andrew. Oh, uh, big sideways slide from the bread right there. That was cool. Tyres in the uh, Turk Rouge. Lift uh, or, or power on oversteer there. That will have caught the attention of the driver. Manu, uh, Emmanuel Piro then through to the lead in the Lotus. All done, not on power, but on the brakes into the Dun Dunlop chicane. He'll lose out and the run down to the Daytona. Chicane and through comes the number 17. That's the Mr. Lister uh, Nobley from 1959, the safe Assam car that vaults to the lead. Can Pirro just close in under the brakes? Not quite. Through in third, Andy will arch it and uh, into the pits from the back of the field. Already a problem for Christian Goddard in the deep Sanderson 3 1. No, I'm not making that up. That sounds much strength in depth here, John, that when you were going through the field, you did get a chance to mention that Jan Magnus is in, is in this race in the Lotus 15th. Obviously hugely successful in IMSA um, and Grand Prix driver for, with uh, Jackie Stewart before that. But I think we must consider it's Gordon Shedden in the uh, lead car. Uh, Magnussen, by the way, is in the Lotus 15, number 58. So. Yeah. Uh, that's the one to watch for. It's the car that Jakob Vigo Holstein uh, entered under. He yeah, he will along on timing with live timing .com forward slash Peter Auto. Uh, and you'll be able to pick that up on your. I'll just put that into your favourite search engine. Healy we and Aston side by side. I'm not sure Jan was going to start this car. We should be able to spot his crash helmet. But uh, pretty sure it's Shedden that's in the lead at the moment. So that's 62 light blue Jap Sinker uh, Healy going through and taking a position there as he was moving up from 16th position. This is like, Peter, this is like I spy British cars of the late 50s and early 60s, isn't it? Oh, and there's one of the DB4 GTs, which has got its just spun and got its rear wheels now, into the ground. That's the Kyle Tilly car. I don't yeah. know if it's Kyle that started it. It's the number 22, that's a very, very famous DB4 GT from period 17 TBX, which uh, won the Essex Racing Stable car, 17 and 18 TBX, driven by Sterling Moss, Jim Clark, uh, Innes Island, 
Salvadori. Is that enough for you? Oh, that's about right, isn't that's it? A, yeah. John, John Ogier's team, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a decent... Just uh, been overtaken Mara's. by the uh, Tom Alexander and James Alexander, his son now racing in the uh, uh, French-registered left-hand drive cream uh, DB4 GT, which is affectionately known as the ice cream van. Of course it is. Because it's yeah. called has been for years. Yeah. Vanilla, please. Yes. Thank you very exactly. much. It's a quick one. Down the inside at Indianapolis, another Aston Martin trying to make up a position. Not sure you're going to outbreak the anomaly ahead of it in... Uh... Ex Peter Thornton, Ian Dalgleish, car 170 yeah. PPL. It's yeah. really sad, isn't it? There's three DB4 GTs in this race, and I've, I've driven two of them. Oh, have you? Yeah, well, you've you have driven that one in the ice cream van. All right. He's driving a microphone now. Yeah. Um, a bit surprised that Piro has dropped to uh, sixth place. That's what I said at the start. He just didn't yeah, have the, doesn't have have the it doesn't have the straight line speed, that car. It didn't, didn't seem to get the start, either. No. Andy Wallace certainly did, and others as well, but it just seemed to, to lose out. So maybe it may be a latent problem manifesting itself in that Piro uh, lister. Is that Pirro's helmet? In that car? Let's have a look. I'm not sure it is, you know. No, maybe he didn't. It's stop. James Ward, I think. Um, in, in that car. Um, sorry, we've got to be looking at the uh, Jaguar Costin, is the well, Pirro car, isn't it? Not the. Uh, the Lotus 15. Yeah, that's, that's 63 is the, the Lotus. Yeah. 65 is the Lister Jaguar. Yeah. It's definitely Gary Pearson because he's wearing the, the open face helmet that he prefers. Traditionally does, yes. Yeah. And behind yeah, uh, James Wood, who was uh, competitive in this race last year. Now you'll be pleased to know, Peter, that the Aston, the car Tilly Aston that spun at uh, Mulsan is pointing back in the right direction and has continued. Oh, is that the Deep Sanderson? The Deep Sanderson was in the pit lane earlier on. Uh, that looks like it's got a front right suspension failure, by the way, it's sitting uh, on, yeah. on the right there. Do you think, John? That was it. Quick glance, we got a bit. That was its out lap. It had made been an early caller into the pits. Now. What number was that, Christian Yeah, 69. Christian Goddard, yes, Gerard Yeah, that is the Deep William. Sanderson. Race did race here at Le Mans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Period. Chris Lawrence was the creator of that car. Chris Lawrence of Morgan fame. Yeah, yeah. So very same, and did actually a little bit of Formula One very briefly. So what's the story behind Deep Sanderson 301? Then is this one of those particularly late fifties, early sixties? So, uh, roughly cars. translated, folks, that means your mission should you choose to accept it. <laughs> well, let's find out what it is. It, it, it's one of those. I'll be honest with you. Well, I saw it on the entry list. I, I had never heard anything about it. See, before. I saw it racing period, and I should know the answer to this. Yeah. But I don't. I don't know why it's called the Deep Sanderson. But but it, it, it's one of those things where you know there were so many garage easters yeah. at this time. You you got a chassis or you got an engine and you built something around it. It's probably based on something else underneath with a uh, with a fiberglass body on. It. Oh yeah. I, well, it is. It is. They're, they're built in Britain. And might see. The last one built was 1986, but they're famous in the 1960s, but designed by Chris Lawrence, as you said. Um, and using a triumph herald subframe or something like that, was it? Or a mini turn round? Using I, a standard, standard engine, and I mean a capital S, as yes. in standard, standard Vanguard tape. engine, yeah. uh, uh, as using the Triumph TR sports cars. Wow. Uh, DS101, uh, which model is this one? It's a 301. It stopped, unfortunately, but we like to enhance people's... With a BMC A-series engine in that one. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. that so makes mini, sense, yeah. mini Morris minor engine. Very good. Well, that makes sense because there was lots of tuning bits for that. So lightweight car um, and based on bits that you could easily get. There was a, a whole raft of them around about this time. It's mid-engined. It's mounted amidships, the engine. BM, a, a mini... BMC mini engine well, and that's subframe, a bit different. That mounted amidships. Yeah. So what they've done is they've put the, the front subframe at the yeah. back, turned it Correct. round, yeah. Correct. and yeah. locked yeah. out the steering pins. I did see it. A mini Clever stuff. Pins. Yeah. Meantime, there's no pulling the ball over your eyes. <laughs> back, got, back at the race, we had a, a well-known lister, Jago Nobley, in the pits retiring with Anthony Schraumermann, uh was the driver, a Belgian chap. It's quite there's so many listers in this race. But obviously the quick one is the one driven by Gordon Shedden. Yeah, at the front of the field, the number 17 leads by just 2.6 seconds yeah. from the Christian Glazel 
Jaguar D type and the Lotus 15, the James Wood car. Well, we think of Flash Gordon, uh, Flash Shedden as a touring car driver. He's done a lot of historic stuff. He's won, he's won the six hours of Spa in GT40. Driven a lot of Philip Walker's cars as we have this Healy going through the chicane. Uh, that's a that's a hundred, isn't it? Not a three litre. Uh, yes, yeah, it is. It's hundred yeah, S. Yeah. Yeah. With that grill, exactly so. Silver. That's, uh, Sebastian Bouchon. Yeah. 100, 100 S, which is a very very rare car. Race one of those, and it's a, a mighty quick little car. It's basically a, a super lightweight race version of the Healy 100. See, given that, you know, I in my formative years in the mid to late 1960s, as far as looking at cars are concerned, there was still some of, there was quite a lot of these cars on the road, not the short wheelbase 250s, in fairness. Didn't see very many of those in Sunderland in the mid 1960s. Probably, less, probably less so now. <laughs> yes, odd, odd that, isn't it? That, but these cars were part of my growing up and certainly um, looking at the Observer book of British cars and all of that sort of stuff that you were doing in those days. Also into the pit lane. What's that? Is that an elite? Elite, yeah. yeah Lotus like elite, elite. Yeah. yeah. Love a Lotus elite. Beautiful car. Much underrated car, I thought. I mean, yeah. Everybody rightly raves about the Elan, but there was something quite pure about the design of the elite. Well, a, a, a fiberglass monocoque. Yeah. Again, uh, cutting edge, Colin. Miles ahead Absolutely. of technology. Absolutely. And, and, and there was, of course, a factory team, Team Elite. Um, in my very early days, I, I was sort of hanging pit balls out for them. So, decent battle going on. Remo Lips John and John Minshaw closing in. Ahead yeah. of Remo is uh, the, the other uh, 250 GT, um, the, the 42 car, with Har which Harrison used uh, down to drive. Then Remo Lips, then John Minshaw in the E-Type, who's hoving into view. So, 20, yeah. 26 is in ninth position. That's the one with the yellow stripe over the bonnet. That's the Akure Frankershaw car. Correct, the Belgian yellow. Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, Reverend Lips is quite a young German driver. He was very successful here. I might have won one of the plateaus last year. He was certainly in a Ferrari doing very well. And uh, he, he's come out of German Formula Renault, so he's a sort of single-seater pilot. So, you know, he's a relatively young kid. No, I'm not, I'm not going to try and put a value on a 250 short wheelbase Ferrari. Yeah. I think it'd be disingenuous, but yeah. it's, it's going to be a large number. It's going to have a lot of noughts in it, to put it that way. Yeah. To watch two of them near identical, racing for position through the forge chicane onto the pit straight, that's proper, proper racing. The only thing these have had now is a bit of rain and a bit of dark. I, I'm right that <laughs> the, the, the bird cage is built on that chassis, isn't it? On, on yes. The, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Completely, the Scuderia SSS. Uh, produced here, that, didn't they? Here comes the 3.8. E-type oh. as all... Well, no, that is going behind the wall, as it is. This is the number 36, the blue. Uh, what was 57 that? is the E-type. Yeah, yeah, that's which uh, is, uh, honoured thief. And Hugo Payen. So, another What's 250. That? What was that? E I'm sorry, I didn't pick up that little blue car. What that was, was, that? was a TVR. It was a TVR, yeah, was it? I think, it's the I think that was the Grand Tourer. The Grand Tourer. Of Number 70, uh, Grand Tourer Mark III of uh, Georgie's uh, Rochietta, I think. It was certainly a TVR, John. Might have been the th 36, actually, Jean-Michel Godet. Same car, but the 36. I'll, we'll spot that yeah. when it comes up as stopped on the, uh, on the screen. Meantime, the Ferrari and uh, Jaguar battle is continuing as we go through the field. With They're almost on wheel to wheel. They're not on our screen at the moment. They are battling really mightily. Number six. And, and then the, the uh, Thorpe uh, flat iron is right with them as well. See the change of co-driver that last minute. Clive Joy in the Ferrari going through the Daytona chicane. That was the bright red number six. Just under 31 minutes, as I say, to go. Uh, here's the, not the bread van, but the ice cream van that Peter yep. was describing earlier on. And uh, that's got some company as well with the... Jaguar E-Type behind it. Uh, the Cooper Monaco has uh, the T49 has dropped back. So that's uh, Guy Ziza coming through in the 82 car. Through to the second chicane for that lovely number six 250 from 1960. Pit window will open at 19.59 and 38 seconds. That's two minutes away. That's that's what you need yeah, to know about exactly. that. Two minutes, yeah. Two minutes. That's the that's the headline number. Two minutes. Absolutely. The 
that lipstick on the front of the Ferrari used to differentiate the cars. Um, nowadays, we tend to get different windscreen banners or uh, uh, rear view mirrors. LED mirror. lights. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not for the first time in my career, I'm going to say anything slightly contentious, but I'm going to say that a short wheel Ferrari is traditionally red or yellow. So short wheelbases look even better in silver, I think. You think? And I think the Rob uh, Walker ones run in navy blue. Oh, navy blue just, for me. Just the ultimate. But, then but you and I have got to think about uh, navy blue, haven't we, Tom? It, I'm, it's John, it's a chair. Call me, Tom, if you want. Be, okay, it's fine. Okay. It's got to be navy blue with a white stripe. Oh. Yes. Going through the field looking at some of the other cars, the number 30 is Peter Vergel in the 356B Carrera GTL. And Very rare car. Yeah, is that is that the one with the above body? I, I believe it is. Yes, yes. Because that isn't even for that car. That isn't standard. Um, that is uh, a very, very good-looking car. The number thirty yeah. you're talking about here. Of yes, it is the above car. Yeah, I've not seen that car before. Um, so that one is a bit of a rarity. Three fifty-six is the first road cars built by Ferry Porsche 75 years ago in May. Mega lap by Gordon Shedden just then, 450.295, fastest lap of the race, five seconds faster than anybody else. Number 80 Porsche in the pit lane early. And I know not why. That's the Francesco Guzman Giro. And that's a 1600 Porsche 356 Speedster. 550 Spider, the number 33 in what we'd now call GT Silver. Very small, very lightweight, Romain Rocher yeah. in the 718 RS60, actually. Uh, they've, got the, they've got the cam cutter off the uh, Climax uh, engine there. Well, they might as well use this time, Andrew, because yeah. The, the cars are going to be racing again a couple of times. This is their first. Uh, this is their first outing. And that's the elite that we were talking about the pit lane earlier on. By the way, looked absolutely immaculate, oh, didn't it? Great. Just beautifully, beautifully presented. We say cam cover off that little Coventry Climax uh, fire engine pump yeah. engine originally. That's um, a FPA and FPF, yeah. etc. FP for fire pump. So that was so that was basically the same as went into the Hillman Imp then. Similar, it's similar. Of, uh, derivative of yes, but yeah. yeah, by then it had evolved quite a bit by then. But yeah, that's basically what it was. It was a, a lightweight, it was made of alloy, yeah, yeah. it was a lightweight, great, meant to be picked up by two firemen and carried to, to site. That's what it was for originally. And then, of course, people at the time thought, well, that, that makes a great little engine for that capacity. It's light already, pre built. I think Colin Chapman probably had that idea. I, I, I was just going to say it probably was Colin Chapman, exactly the sort of thing, but that's exactly what he did. Up goes the shutters, the pit window is open. And a problem for at uh, the Daytona chicane for Guillaume Gagnard in uh, an Austin Haley Sprite Bonneville, which is another unusual car, different bodywork on that machine. And I believe that car to have stopped. Well, try and confirm if that car's moving again for you. Austin Haley and MG both. Tried to break various records at Bonneville very successfully as far as MG were concerned. And both uh, both or two of the DB4 GT Astons into the pits, the notable one being 64, which is Adrian Beecroft, who's uh, sharing that car according to our programme with uh, Mademoiselle Nicola von Dernhoff, but didn't actually change. Uh, and that uh, Adrian Beecroft's got the second place DBR1 that finished here 1959. 410 YUF is the Oscar. Yep. And that white car with the red racing stripe over the roof and the sort of double bubble on the top of the roof, which is very fashionable. Also with uh, air extraction on the back of that, so you could sit in it with your uh, racing helmet, bit of extra room. Oh, lovely, yeah. nice. That, what you want to hear through a corner, and Peter, you know this, you do plenty of instructing. If you're going to squeal the tyres, you want it to be a continuous squeal all the way through the corner. It's not... Because <laughs> that, that means you're driving it like a 50 pence piece. And, oh. and ideally from the rear, on the rear-wheel drive car, not the front. Uh, yes, indeed so. Zagato body on that car. I was just going to say how similar yeah. to a Zagato Aston it looked at the front, and that explains why. And... Um, 
think some an English driver was listed for that. 37, yeah. Uh, Martin Stratton listed. Uh, Do you know, I, when it went by, I just thought... Right. Is that, is that they Stratton at the wheel, look at his helmet. I was going to say, I thought Danger it was Martin. Mouse. Danger Mouse at the wheel of that, yeah. Morgan into the pit lane with 25 minutes to go. The pit window is open. Oh, we've had a track limits call. A track limits call for... Six. Would it be Stratton? Uh, no, it wasn't, actually. <laughs> uh, it's the Alexander's, actually. It was, at, yeah. the, at the exit of the Dunlop chicane. Well, you can steal a little bit there. Oh, Danger Mouse picking, pitching that car in, virtually picking it up and throwing it at the corners. Another one of the uh, the, the Richard Bradley school of racing that uh, drives anything. Give him a wheelbarrow, shopping trolley, he will drive it quickly and well. It has wheels. doesn't even have an engine, but preferable if it does. Yeah, fair point well made. Two-time thoroughbred GP champion in uh, Tyrrells. Christian Glasel with the list of 15 right behind him. So this is the battle for second, third and fourth with the Jaguars and the Lotus in close contention. And I think that's Andy Wallace just in behind them as they peel off yeah, in the pits. That is Wallachie's uh, helmet. Pearson's yeah. in. Woods in. Wallace is in. So 44 from second. Uh, top three, all coming. Yeah. Uh, did the 17 come in as well? Andy Wallace with the 774 RW in red numbers on white, which aren't, of course, your standard UK number plate. For years, I w I'd only ever seen black and white pictures of it, so it didn't didn't red register gel, at red all. Tree, yeah. And then, of course, I saw a, a picture of it, and they are what used to be called trade plates. So it was a, a, a number that was assigned to a garage rather than to a car, and you could use them for ferrying cars around. The old adage in the police force was then, was uh, there was two. There was ones with uh, red numbers and one with white numbers. White on red, don't bother your head, because they were normally OK. Red on white, stop on sight because well, they were always being misused. Well, the point, the point was you could drive it, because the point being for the, the trade was that they were, were for the motor trade. Correct. And therefore, your customers' cars came in. You didn't need to be insured, yeah. MOT. You drove them on your, you drove, on your business well, On your trade plate. You're, they, you're, you're talking in the past. I've seen one in the last week. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. Still, don't oh, they have a little funny triangle on the they, top of it. They do, uh, yeah. It must be an insurance or something. It's the, it's the Department of Transport Steel yeah. on that. So some names on the side of that that drove the car in period. Mike Hawthorne, Ivor Bueb, I think, was the main driver of this particular car. Yeah, Wynn Percy lived on the side there's there a, as well. There's the Lotus Elite going out in the Team Elite colours, which became the Sid Taylor Racing colours subsequently. There's the... So... So the D-Type yeah. making its way out of the pits. And, uh, Beautiful, beautiful to Ferrari, uh, number 60 in the bread van looking. It's going to look a mucky because it had a massive rebuild after last year. But uh, now I'm, I'm obviously with no structural damage. That was that makes life a little bit easier. But yes. given the damage it did sustain at this meeting last year, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I did not expect this to see that car out again was in 12 that, months. Was that a failure of that? on that car or was there nothing was ever really said no, or no. we, saw, we saw the end of the incident on, yeah. on, yes. on television and I that remember. was it and J James Wood was alongside it if I remember and he said there was something something strange going on but he right. didn't say what it was so well everybody, everybody was okay and the car was rebuilt yeah, and that's yeah. that's the uh, most important thing in that order yes that was Magnuson's absolutely. car we just saw in there at the Lotus 15 I presume Magnuson's now got in it that was the number 58, yeah. just leaving the pit lane. Jan Magnussen, 24, 25, Le Mans, 24 hours now for the affable Dane. Ah. Now termed. Now we've got something uh, parked on the left-hand side. I just wonder if that's got a... Uh, it's, uh, it's pulled out of the way. Oh, it's got a, a right rear suspension failure. Oh dear! Uh, oh, that was that. Uh, it's not. It's not a little Lotus, but it's of that ilk on the open 50s uh, sports car. Unfortunately, I saw it from the rear, so I can't get a number on it yet. Here we go. Uh, French register. It um, is. Or has it? It's just the way it's. Yes, it has. So yeah, no, I think I, the right the right wheel is. It's a it's a wheel or hub failure, isn't it, John? It, <sighs> Do we think ends it ends in a nine? Seventy nine, I think. That car. Load of Mark One. Mm -hmm. Thomas Truchen, he could well be right. 
It looks I like that. I think it's 79. There certainly was a nine on the end of it. Yeah, there was. And it, it would sort of be there. That's a good call, John. I we'll arch right. it down to the second chicane in the number 49 D type. Straight out of the pits and straight back on it. He's not sharing. So bit, he gets straight back on it. Bit of a mystery. How did Shedden go behind the Thorpe car? Because they're not showing us making pit stops. Although the last Shedden lap was 5.25. Yeah, that's the 67 that leads the Lister and the... the I'm the talking double, about the 17, yeah. The 17 in second. Those but, are the, the places that Andrew is seeing has changed over. Why flat out, in fact? No, that car's dropping but down. So there's a problem with that under 17. That, that 30 seconds on a lap would be, yeah. that would account for that. Yeah. yeah, so that car's got an issue. It has not come into the pit lane. Why flat iron and why knobbly then? Why those two names? Well, the knobbly is the, uh, the the shape of the car that was done to be nice and uh, nice and pristine at the time and trying trying to be aerodynamic. And curvy, it, yeah. Curvy. And it was, uh, who, who designed it? it Mike, uh, Mike Costin. Mike Costin. Yeah. Yes. And apparently he, he's, he showed it to his wife who looked at it and said, oh, that looks rather knobbly, Nobbly, doesn't yeah. it? And it stuck. Oh, uh, really? Literally, he, he presented it to her, and yeah. that, that's where it comes from. Yeah. The flat iron it predates that car. It's a 1960 yep. car. Um, then I don't know the reason it's called a flat iron. Well, the knobbly's from 59. Yeah. The flat iron's from and then, of course, you had... Yeah, the way around, yeah. And then, yeah. then, of course, you had the cost-embodied ones, which yeah. were smoother. Yeah, but what the flat iron? What, this is... Two D-types side-by-side. Yeah. Andy Wallace Two. going past RSF. 302. So Wallace, then that will have been. I don't think that was a pass for position. I think it was. What's that? Oh, no, that uh, was. That's the 40. That's a... No, it's the 44 car. Yeah. That car's dropped behind. So uh, they I, came, I, I, so they came no. into the pits the opposite way around. Wallace had to stand still in the pits longer because he's the pro no. driver. But and then he's caught the Glazel car and yeah. we passed it on the outside. Pearson got out, Glazel got in. Yeah. That's what's happened. So, Wallace came into the pits first, but had to stand still. So the number 44 got out before it, and Andy's just chased it back down again. Second one, of course, an ex security cost car. The other one, a factory car in period, I think. So who do we think's in the 44 now, is that? Glazel. That is Christian Glazel. Glazel. Yeah, there's a lot of experience in some very fast, Glazel. particularly Ferraris. He's moving it around, he's very yeah. confident on the brakes. It's not often that anybody takes time out of Andy Wallace on the brakes, and he has a little look down the inside, the second oh, part yeah. of the Ford chicane. That was brave. How fabulous is this, seeing two D-types racing wheel to wheel around Le Mans? Yeah, awesome stuff. Andy Wallace, who actually made a mistake there and cost RML their third race in a row in the MG. Most un Wallachian like. Yeah. He loved me for reminding everybody of that. I can imagine, yes. <laughs> he does a lot of uh, development and test work, doesn't he, these days for Bugatti? Yeah. Just all the high speed work. Big advocate of electric cars on the road. Uh, I think he's, he, he only drives uh, his daily cars, are all, all electric. Last time I had lunch with him and. Uh, James Weaver, along with the founder of DailySportsCar.com, Malcolm Cracknell, had a lovely lunch out. And Ollie Gavin was there as well. No recording equipment um, allowed in. It was good for... Oh, that's a shame. No, no, no. Absolutely. Uh, it was oh, perfect. Um, was it? Okay. It was, it was, well, it was perfect. In your book, mate. <laughs> About time he wrote it. Um, Malachi oh, pulling um, away from that second D type and now scored as the leader ahead of Christian Glasel. Just see that the Shedden car has gone purple in all three sectors, and I'm now wondering was it Assan in the car and now it's gone Shedden? I, I think it was because I think yeah. Assan was the car in the, the pits yeah. now. On the time given, I, I think it was. I don't think it was flash in it to start with. Well, it's now in the pits. So. That that lap time must have been the earlier time because it'll revert to its best uh, sectors when it comes into the pits. I, I thought I saw Shedden's helmet, but um, meantime in one, two, three, four, five, six, Harrison, the Harrison Newey car along with uh, John McCary, that's just gone fastest of anybody in the first sector. This is one of the 250 GTs we were watching 
earlier, 26 and 42, first and second in their classes, and fifth and sixth overall. But at the moment, the absolute undisputed leader and pulling away, Andy Wallace. 4.55.891 last time around. Not the outright fastest lap of the race. That goes to the number 63, the James Wood car, and the Lotus 15. So that car has certainly found some time. 4.55.542, the best for that car, but he wasn't. Uh, that was an outlap, of course, last time around, so that's why it was nowhere near that. Meantime, another old English white, sort of, yep. car in the pit lane. That's a car that Andy Middlehurst has been driving. And it is another one oh, of oh. the... Well, that's a, a, just a 3.4, not a 3.8 litre short wheel, short uh, nose daytime. Short nose, yeah. Very pleasant colour. Now, a bit of a problem. Oh, big lock up. Oh. The Oscar and completely crossed up as it was braking. That's not Martin Stretton in that car anymore. That was a different helmet in that. So obviously they, they'd done their pit stop we hadn't seen. Yeah, that will have been then. Down the inside at Indianapolis. Short burst through to Arnage. And then romping down the straight. It's the Ecos D-type Andrew's talking about, dealing with a similar car in what looks at the moment a slightly vain chase of Andy Wallace, Christian Glasel, with the light just starting to fade. We're not into full twilight yet. I think we could call this the gloaming at the moment. The headlights are starting through the gloaming. Yeah, we are racing through the gloaming. Bit window has closed. As yellow flags are out, double yellows are out at the end of the lap. I think somebody might have gone off at the Ford chicane. 12, 1, 2, 3, 4. 12 minutes and 34 seconds left. A 75 in the pit lane as well. Now, that car was going well in its class yeah. earlier on. But that's that now dropped down. This is the GM Gagnard car. That was the leader in class in the Austin Healy Sprite yeah. Bonneville. Yeah, Seabreeze Sprite, really. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure they, they've got the Bonneville name. They, they were, those were known as Seabreeze Sprites. Sprite. Yes. Morgan. Being passed Just by the second place Slightly getting in the way by Roddy Glazel. Oh, and that, I think and there was, that... was um, RSF 301 and RS F302, weren't the two? Fastest people. lap of the race and his class for Andy Wallace. He goes through in a 54 1. Behind him, Christian Glasel puts that car's fastest lap of the race in. A 4.55.327. They are both in the same class, of course. James Wood's just gone through in the Lotus, and he's only another four seconds further back uh, now. And John, remember, there's only got a two-litre climax engine. Yeah. It's got an FBF engine in that one. But quite similar to the Lotus 11 in concept, but just a bigger version of it with a bigger engine. Air temperature is 21 Celsius. The track temperature holding steady at 24. So these are good conditions. The number 42 Ferrari 250 now has got ahead of the number 26. Those were the two cars that were battling in their class. They're now fourth and fifth, those two silver Ferraris. So the Harrison Newey car ahead of the Remo Lips car, 42 from 26, and Harrison putting that class as best lap in last time around with a 457 night. So let's just remind ourselves again, as Peter has been wont to do today, and he's absolutely right to, to continue doing this, we are talking about the top four all... Oh, no, more than that. We've got seven... Seven cars, all lapping under five minutes for eight and a half miles. And these are 1957 to 1961 cars. They have certain parts of equipment, don't they? Oh. I'm talking about the peddlers. You're talking about the steerers, yeah. <laughs> yes, the steerers. The loose nuts behind the wheel. In the pit lane for fairly... Oh, oh dear. we'll go back that's to that. Maserati. So that's a Maserati. Uh, that, that's a Dunlop, I think, going up the hill. Um, just at the exit of the motorcycle, or be just beyond the exit of the motorcycle pit lane. And meantime, a very handsome 
Aston Martin. Yeah, that's a, Adrian there. Beecroft uh, standing at yeah. the front of that. That's Beecroft's uh, with, uh, with, Paul, yeah. with Nicola von uh, Donhoff. Yeah. Well, yeah, so the man that owns not the winning uh, Aston Martin DBR1 from 1959, but the second place car, that'll do. So that was a DB4 GT. That's DB4 GT. Yeah, yeah, that was the 64 car that was in the pit lane. And how did it get there? Answer, it just pulled off with... Smoking brake, some, something good, yeah. Right yeah. rear or right, right front? front I think, yeah. Right front, I think, yeah, but yeah. it stopped, yeah. Yeah. So, also a problem at uh, the Ford Chicane again. So, was that, the, that was the Ford Chicane? No, I don't think it was, no. Uh, Can we see on the tracker where it was? Uh, That's well, what I'm just yeah. looking for now. It's, uh, it's uh, not showing. Meanwhile, so the, meanwhile, yes, the Wallace, types. meanwhile, Wallace has got a little bit of breathing space and cutting oh. through the traffic nicely as he goes past the Lotus Elite in the number 49 Jaguar. The top four, Andrew, all put their best laps of the race in, three of those being the best laps for their class. 4.54, one last time around for Andre Wallace leading. 4.55, for Christian Glasel in second. 4.54, for the Lotus 15 in third, and the Ferrari 250, 457, nine. So those were all set last time around. Also last time around, under five minutes, the John Minshaw number three E-Type Coupe, the 3.8. Very handsome car, that, very pretty. John, um, the Marshall's Post, the yellow flag, sorry, Marshall's Post 20 and 32, if that helps, to where that Maserati may be. 32 is um, exit to the Ford Chicane, and 20, is down at Mulsan Corner. Oh, now we've got an elite Lake, further off. Yeah. That's number two. What? That's uh, Mark Gordon, uh, Nick Finbo. Mark Gordon races uh, Jaguar 120 in the he UK. He in quite, class. Uh, uh, quite well. He's we the right size for the inside of an elite as well. As we a should, tiny statue yeah. like a shop. We should add that Lotus Elite, particularly Team Elite, had tremendous success here at Le Mans. Um, won the index of thermal efficiency. David yeah. Hobbs driving with uh, Frank Gardner, I think, that particular year. But for many years, they were very successful here. I, I, would, I would say, the, I'd argue the elite really put Lotus on the map as a, as a, a seller of customer cars. Um, that's where race cars right, are made. That's yeah. where the Mazda is. I just caught a flash of white there. That's at the exit of the Porsche curves then, really, rather than the Ford Chicane. So he's gone straight on there, I think. Is that Marshall Post 32 then? That's 32. That's where the okay, right. I think that's where the Mazda is. And we've put a slow zone in. Um, Marshall Post 21 was the exit of the um, Mulsanne Corner. That's yeah, where the number two yeah, has yeah. stopped, that Lotus. So, slow zone now at five. The leaders, I think, have just gone through there, so it won't affect them. We've got just under seven minutes remaining of this Plateau 3, Grid 3 race, our final action of today on the World Feed. Talking. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. Talking of elite, number 14 is the uh, little white one of uh, Pierre Fillon. Yeah, Pierre uh, Fillon, the and, um, we've got president. A, a TBR facing the opposite way again. That's our Nage. Number 70. Pierre Fillon, the president of the ACO. George Rochietta. Oh, and in, he's in, right in the firing line there. That is in danger there. And this elite is being tugged out. That's at Mulsanne Corner, the elite. Well, Let's just check to see what's going on with the leaders. Nearly five seconds now, Andy Wallace over Christian Glasel. Uh, well, Archie, not having any fun at all. Complete chore for him here. Not. Lights beginning to come on around the circuit now. Uh, as we look into the Bugatti circuit, you can see the lights beginning to make a little bit of a difference. We're back tomorrow for another couple of sessions for you. So we'll take in some of the cars that we've not yet seen. So please make a note uh, on your diary app or however you do that. We'll be back at, uh, for the uh, second race uh, of, sorry, for the third, third race, race. The final race of the first plateau. Uh, and we will run from a quarter to eight Central European summertime to uh, 11 o'clock, then take uh, a quick break till midday and then have the final races from uh, Plateau 4, Plateau 5. And we're going to see cars we haven't six. seen before. Yeah, because yeah. we haven't seen uh, 
four, five, two. two. Yet, and we haven't seen four, five, and well, six. Well, we caught the end of two, didn't we, just? Yeah, so, just yeah, indeed. Yeah, we so. didn't see the racing. So, John, you've, you've covered uh, races at Le Mans of various descriptions of different categories, sorry, different regulations mm. uh, over the years. Uh, I've got to ask you this question. If, uh, if Andy Wallace continues and wins this race, does that make him a two-time Le Mans winner? Wow. wow, yes. Very good. In a way. In a way, absolutely. But I, I, it's great to see, because Andy drove this car at Goodwood earlier in the season and, and was sort of back in the field a bit, and I didn't really understand it, didn't get a chance to talk to him, it must have had a problem. Now it's going really well. For Pete's sake, has tweeted in at RSL underscore studio, um, and this was a, a little while ago, sorry, I've just it's just popped up here. The Deep Sanderson you were talking about earlier on, derived from jazz performer Deep Henderson and Chris Lawrence's mother's maiden name. Wow. Mega. That's not even on Wikipedia. No, that, that's that's proper greater depth, isn't it? Yeah, that's... yeah. Thank you. I have never seen that written, never. Well, there you go. Uh, it must be somewhere. Morgan being pushed into retirement, the maroon and white yeah. car. But the, the racing version had the louvres in the back where normally the wheel, the spare wheel would be. I don't know if you can just see it. Was that uh, to help cool the, yeah. the diff and what yeah. was under there, yeah. oil coolers or something yeah. underneath yeah. the back of there? Now, oh, change of lead. Yeah, change of change lead, lead out of that picture. The cost is here? back in the lead. So Andy Wallace has had an issue somewhere. Yes, he lost six seconds in the middle sector. Was that just traffic or did he have an issue? They're at Arnage. Are they coming to Arnage now out of Indianapolis with traffic, including that above Porsche 356. Down the inside of one of the E-types. That's the he will have 35 yeah, car. Right up his... Source down, goes to the left, but there's a car in the way. Can he get across? Yes, he does. And I think he's going to power back into the lead, isn't he? Because he's got... Yes, he goes back into the lead. Terrific driving by the man from Oxfordshire. So, Andy Wallace, then, what happened to him for him to have lost the lead slightly earlier in the lap? I think he must have... Oh, looks like the car just cut out coming into Mulsanne Corner. It does. Maybe... No, I think it was. Oh, no. There was a, it was a yellow zone. It was a there, was a, yellow. there was a green flag on the oh, right, and Andy Wallace yes. was observing it completely and yeah. waiting until he got alongside the green flag. That's yeah. what it was. Yes. So, Wallachi back in the lead. Still that Maserati sitting on the outside of the middle of the or the end of the Porsche coast. Andy and Christian Klarsall absolutely ragging these D types. This will be the last lap that we start now with, even with that slowing down. And look at the traffic. A, Andy did a 452.464, even slowing down, and a 455.327 by Oh, Christian that Porsche Glasser. turned right in front of the D-Type, the, uh, the cost car. And that was the... That might bear you the race right there with a minute and 27 seconds to go. Coming out of the Ford chicane, it was ever thus, traffic giveth, traffic taketh away. And now the Akos Jaguar has to push very hard indeed. And Andy Wallace is not a man, Peter Snowden, to be denied any victory, particularly not at the Circuit de la Sarte. Certainly not, and I think, if I'm honest, that uh, that he, that, uh, and he said e then d has got the, got the legs uh, of the, uh, the the detail behind it, um, so to speak. Um, but the traffic there just couldn't be helped at the chicane. It's, it's how it happens. You know, cars can't disappear. It's a tight part of the circuit. The, the Porsche's got to get through his racing line as well. It's just it's just how it falls, as you said, John. It uh, giveth and it, it taketh away. But we are onto the final lap. It's in hot pursuit, uh, Christian goes. But I think Andy Wallace uh, has ju just, just got enough over uh, the similar 57 model behind it. Traffic could yet pay a play a part. Blue flags, meaning quicker cars coming behind you. Really noticeable how the evening is drawing in here. And Glasel's not had the best of the traffic again going into the first. The Daytona chicane. Yeah, stuck behind the Morgan SLR. There. That's a rare car as well, that number 61 machine. Simon Arbogani, is it? Yes, is it that, is, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, in the Morgan SLR from 1965. Not your usual looking Morgan, that. The usual looking Morgan is the one going slowly at the moment that the leaders are just passing. That's got a problem. They shared that body with a Healy, didn't they? Healy race did. that same SLR body. Yes. Yep. Andy with his the AW on his crash helmet. You see the if you're watching red, on white, the screen, blue. Yeah. Mm. It always very similar to Martin Brundles, isn't it? I yeah, was no, but it's, it's his initials, yeah. isn't it? Andy, who well, I first met Andy was a gas fitter, racing in Formula Four. Oh. He's come along now. Oh, so pushing hard in second. A few abandoned cars around the side of the circuit now, but deemed to be in uh, relative places of relative safety. So halfway around the final lap of the race, the leaders coming down to the furthest part away from the pits. Oh, lock up from Glasgow. Will he get the car turned in? He's just Gosh. about to. My goodness. No ABS on these cars, no traction control. He had to manually ABS. It's called cadence <laughs> braking on and off the middle pedal and trying to get the wheel straight and then feel for the grip again, the chirping of the racing tyres. He'd, he'd have known he was in trouble just before that, Peter. You sort of braking and turning through that right-handed kink before the Mulsanne corner itself. I've heard that moment described by other drivers of when you, when you think you just you outbreak yourself, you can't turn it in, you try not to lock it up to steer into the gravel. Of that, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? I've heard it described as a love actually moment, <laughs> and I think you need to understand the film to know what we mean. Very good, very good. De oh, and that's Wallace. That's Wallace. Wallace yeah, yeah. Locked, we heard it. Oh, no, now as he stayed on the track, he has. All of the road and some of the yellow and blue curbs used by the chasing car in second. These are the leading pair now. Coming through to the Porsche Curves Complex for the final time in this Plateau 3 race. And this will be our last live action of the evening. Don't leave us, though. We've got a word with Emmanuel Piro, who's been in this race in a moment or two. Now... Is there anything that can deny Andy Wallace? The last time we said, can we call him a two, a double Le Mans winner, uh, immediately he lost the lead. <laughs> so that was the absolute curse of the commentary booth. I'm keeping out, quiet. Pointed out by Wicker Bill on at RSL Studio. Thank you all, by the way, for your contributions today. It's really kept us going. We can't read them all out, as you know, but we've been watching them. And uh, more than the odd giggle or two, thank you very much indeed. And for the information as well. But this then, the first run for the Plateau 3 cars, they'll race in the darkness and then we'll see them again tomorrow for the final race and hopefully Crown Air Champion will be able to give you that news tomorrow in our sessions that starts just before 8 o'clock Central European summer time. Work that out for yourself. But it is Andy Wallace in a very famous car that comes to the line and takes the win by, in the end just on a second and a half and it was nearly five seconds at the start of that lap coming through in third the lotus 15 which did look very good on the brakes but ultimately just didn't have the straight line speed i think to compete with the cars around it although it has beaten two of the ferraris james wood goes through then 20 seconds away from the lead in the battle of the 250 GT short wheelbase cars from 1961, it's the number 42 car that I think has prevailed. That changed a lap or two ago. We'll wait for that one to come across the line as it will do in a moment. Just to confirm that. 42, that's a bit further back than I thought actually. And that should be through any time. Now, it has gone through. And then the 26 in the similar car, winning its class, the Lister Jaguar flat iron from 1960. Next up, then it'll be an E-type for the 3.8 car. The number 82 car wins its class, and the Lotus 11 wins its class as well. Here's Emmanuel Pirro on this weekend's action. Emmanuel et Piro, so nice to see you again. What did you think exactly of the centenary race three weeks ago in Le Mans? Were you happy by the, the outcome? 
Well, when you hold the Le Mans 24 hours I, I witnessed so far, I thought you cannot do anything bigger than this. But in fact, the Centenaire was, was bigger. There was a special vibe, special atmosphere. And I think the ACO, they used this opportunity very, very, very well. They organized a lot of side activity. They gathered, I think, more than 60 Le Mans winners, which is something that will never happen again in the history of motorsport. They put them in the museum, which was a dream to watch. So, and also, and this I have to say, it's a coincidence, but a lot of manufacturers, they came back to compete in the WEC and Le Mans. So this was, uh, let's say, an extra uh, treat for all the spectators. So it, it was an unforgettable weekend. Ferrari won which um, I think it was good for the whole motorsport. Sorry for Toyota, sorry for Porsche, sorry for all the others, but I think a, a win of Ferrari meant a lot for the motorsport as a whole. I don't say it as an Italian, but in general. And so it was just a perfect weekend. And three weeks later, for you, it was logical, natural to be here for Le Mans Classic? Well, Le Mans Classic, it's a must for me. It's, it's so, so special. Not only you see a very large number of old cars, but you leave a special atmosphere. So it's, it's not only about historic racing, but this is also historic ambient. You know, the paddock, the way it is, the, 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 the distance between the fans and the cars and the driver is so close, like it was in the old days. So it, it's really special. And I have to say, looking at the number of people, I'm not the only one thinking like this. What cars will you drive this weekend? I drive a, a very, very beautiful car, which is a Ford uh, GT40. I also drive a listed Jaguar. And then in the Le Mans winning cars parade, I drive the Alfa Romeo 8 cylinder. So very, very special car. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Emmanuel Piro speaking to us earlier in the weekend. Well, what a way to finish off our day. Let's remind ourselves of what happened in that race. There's some penalties, but it's not affected the top results. Started the race with a very decent group of, what, 15 or 20 cars together. And very early on, the Lotus 11 right up the inside into the first corner. Perot was quick as well at the beginning. But it didn't take long, Andrew Murray, for the Jaguar D-Tags to work their way through. Andy Wallace, of course, never backwards in coming forwards. It most certainly didn't, John, but we've got a couple of mysteries to unravel. Piro first, what happened to him? He dropped out of the race. What happened to the bread van? We love seeing the bread van back. We had lots of cars retiring with all kinds of problems, collapsed suspensions, blown engines, usual sort of thing you get in historic racing. But ultimately, it boiled down to a tremendous battle between the two Jaguar D-types, Andy Wallace, and the car that was started by Gary Pearson, taken over by Christian Glazel. We had uh, Wood doing a great job in the Lotus 15 in third place, but he didn't have anything for the two D-types. There was a lot of traffic. Here's the pit stops. And uh, you see the two D-types came in together. Andy, now, Wallace. Andy Wallace came in in front uh, of the other day type yeah. because he was stationary longer as part of his uh, being a winner i suppose being a winner here yeah he had to chase it down which he did admirably side by side coming out of arnage just got a bit of extra drag and that looked to be it however there was another part of the story to yeah. be written because andy wallace slowing for a yellow flag and the green flag just, I think, coming out ahead of him as the number 44 D-type came through. It had been yellow at that point for the spun Lotus, which had been uh, which had been recovered. And then out of Arnage again, where Andy did seem to have a little bit of a grip advantage, he got to the left-hand side and cut back uh, alongside the 356 Abarth car and got back into the lead. And after that, he was not headed to the line. Split by Lotus Elite, and I noticed that Fion managed to win his class at yep. Lotus Elite. It's good for the president. So, what terrific uh, day's racing we've had thus far. It's going to go on, of course. Um, 
into the night and uh, through the small hours of the morning and then we'll be back, John. Peter Snowden and Andrew Marriott alongside me, John Hindoff. Thanks to our production team. Everyone put in a decent shift today. Great action, great variety. Uh, rejoin us tomorrow at uh, a little before 8 o'clock Central European Summer Time. We'll see the final races of all six plateaus to decide the destination of the trophies. Quick reminder of the results here. With the two D-types winning from the Lotus 15, then the two Ferraris, first and second in class. And going through, James Thorpe and John Minshaw won their classes. Sergio Krekinov in the Lotus 11 won theirs. Eugene Delaplanque in the Aston, uh, the Austin Healy. In fact, two Healy's winning their classes. And then uh, Keith Arler's winning in the Morgan and uh, Francois Fion in third in his class. I just noticed there, Pierre Fion, better in his class than his brother. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Join us tomorrow. We have two further sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, with all six grids being represented. What a fabulous Super Saturday we've had here at the Le Mans Classic. We'll be back with you tomorrow for the denouement of the 11th edition of Le Mans Classic, live across the world in sound and vision from the Circuit de la Sarte. Have a good Saturday evening, wherever you are. From John Hindoff and the team, good night, God bless. <laughs>